All right, so let's see on here. We've got, so I wanted to give a talk on this for quite some time actually, and uh, when I agreed to do it, I was like, yeah, I have these thoughts in my head. I'll write them down and, and we'll talk about like the, the love-hate relationships, the blessings and curses of, of using modern day frameworks. And as I started writing it down, I was like, oh, here's another thing, here's another thing. And so I kept on adding to it until I realized like I just made a huge mess that wasn't congruent and, and I created something that I've always hated. And one of the things that uh, modern day frameworks also suffer from, which is sometimes it looks like an easy path to make your life simpler and then next thing you know it just added to this huge layer of complexity. So this was originally going to be my final slide, but I decided to put it up front because I fell victim to my own problem where I created way too much complex slides and information that was just not really relevant and it really is, it's hard to make something simple in many different ways. So when it comes down to it, uh, frameworks are here to make your life simple. Uh, but the problem is, what is the definition of a framework? I pulled this off of Google just for the fun of it. But the primary thing that it says is that it's a part of the structure, like the frame of a house or the, or the frame that you're actually going to be building on top of. So it's something that's not meant to be thrown out. And it's also something that adds to the foundation. And it's like, okay, well, that's a nice superficial message, but what does that, what does that really mean at, for us as software developers? And this is my own little definition that I like to use. It's a layer of abstraction to try and create protocols or conventions to trivialize specific tasks. And there's many different areas where we use frameworks on a day-to-day -day basement, whether we want to or not, whether we like them or not. Uh, and normally you'll see like we use a lot of, you know, we're, you know, people are hiring for Node, which is a, you know, a framework inside of JavaScript. Uh, our front end uses either React or, or Angular, it uses Bootstrap. You know, if you go back even further, as there is the fight between jQuery and Prototype and, and you know, Move Tools and YUI and all this other stuff. You got Yi, Laravel, Symfony, uh, Code Igniter. Still, you got Cake. You've got uh, creators of Cake went off and formed Lithium. Uh, you know, you just got so many shoes, and these are just in, in these languages that you know, are tangible to the PHP user group. I mean, other than that, you, you even got what's known as speci uh, specified or specific frameworks, like WordPress, Magento, Joomla. Like, all of these solve uh, a, a, a particular task, as well as, uh, and that's why I said, like, in my definition, it's something that helps create specifications or a protocol to trivialize or add a layer of abstraction to mundane tasks or things to make your life easier. And it's like layers of abstractions and eliminate levels of concern. So and when I was doing this, I actually came across um, actually where someone asked uh, Rasmus if uh, what was his opinion on frameworks. And his very first response, three word sentence was, they all suck. Simple as that. And, you know, everyone kind of laughed and clapped. And Ray's like, but while they all suck, everyone needs to use a framework. And this goes on into a nice little three minute clip. I do not know if I have audio here or not, but even if I did or did not, I don't know. It's not probably not worth showing. Oh, I don't think I do. But in here, he actually answers the question and talks about it. Now this was back in 2013. So a lot of things have actually changed since then. When he mentions about them sucking, the other thing is uh, it was kind of the evolutionary period of PHP as well. And a lot of them have actually helped been addressed um, in many different ways. And we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that later. But I think I, it'd be good to start with why I personally hate frameworks, like the level of frustration that I get with dealing it. And is that, it actually kind of culminates um, to the day where I actually remember why I wanted to give a talk on something like this, because it was a, I actually got hired on in a new company, and there's another guy who got hired about the same time I did. And when we were going about our tasks, he would always give updates on why he felt that we were stupid for choosing our framework and why we should have gone with Falcon because it's, it's a PHP module, it's written in C, it's loaded into memory. It's like, we are making a stupid decision by sticking with our framework, we should throw out everything and go to this. And then he, in one of their, uh, he would always give updates on, frame, on his favorite frameworks uh, on our standups, <laughs> like unsolicited. 
And then, um, and then I remember in one meeting that we had, uh, again, out of nowhere, he mentioned, it's like, I would rather gouge out my eyes with my toes than use X. And I'm like, wow. It's like, that, that's some, some vitriolic hate right there. And it's like, it's just opinionated. So there's a lot of things that I actually share a lot of the same feelings and emotions he has at, with all frameworks, you know, even my favorite ones. I was like, there's a lot of things where I, when I'm doing a framework or learning a new one, I say to myself, I know how to do this. I know how to write this query. Why do I have to learn this special syntax or do this to do something I know? And I, can, I know how efficient it is. I may be able to make it more efficient than what this framework can do. It's like, there's, you know, there's all this bloat and complexity. There's hooks. Like, there's the before filter. There's the after filter. There's this. Like, oh, why do I have to learn all this stuff? It's like, I don't like their methodologies. There's a lot where I was like, I have to pass in like this huge array for no, you know, to fill out all the properties of the array. Why can't I just write two lines of code? Why do you make me have to fill out this property? And it's like, you know, can't figure out or understand the methodologies. You try to read their documentation. It's like, if you want more, ask the community. And everyone else has the same question, but you don't, you can't figure it out. Um, you know, or the, the niche syntax, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure that many of us have these exact same. Uh, gripes at some point in our career where we have to use something that we just, ugh, like why can't I switch it to something that I like? And it's like, and even if it's something that, that benefits your career, like um, going back, you know, I remember having to use even jQuery. And it's like, oh, look how much simpler it makes it. You have other people who says like, well, it's just, it's just a XHR request. That's not that hard. Like just learn how to do that. And then you see people who are using it improperly, where they're always using jQuery to get element by ID. And then the next line, jQuery to get element by ID. And then the next line, jQuery to get element by ID. It's like, this is, you know, it's like, you don't need to do it. Save it to a variable. Like, the reason why people hate this framework is because people use it improperly or don't know how to use it. And then you get new frameworks like Angular, where they're like, it's like, oh, we, we realize that, that DOM parsing is expensive. Well, yeah, it's really expensive if someone doesn't know how to parse the DOM properly. If they do, I've seen some functions where it's like 70 DOM parses inside of one page. Just, and a lot of it was superfluous. So anyways, not to, not to go on too long, but I, I wanted to put this out just because we all have this. Like it, this is a very common gripe that everyone has and it's, and it's very subjective. So what you gripe about something, someone else may not. And, but that's where this tribalism comes in when you start talking about it. Because then you start talking to someone else. It's like, oh, you hate that framework? I love that framework. And, it's like, and, and here's the thing that we always have to remember, that what, what may be a square peg for you in you know, your round hole was perfect for someone else. There's a lot of frameworks where you can skip the mundane part of your job. Um, you don't have to worry about sanitization. You don't need to worry about you know, dealing with a, you know, the, the raw input request. You don't need to worry about the HTTP protocol. You, you know, there's just so many things that can be done for you. And this is very true with you know, frameworks like uh, Magento and WordPress. You ask a lot of developers, especially seasoned PHP developers, they'll say, like, I hate the fact that everyone presumes that I know WordPress or that I want to work in WordPress. I like to develop my own code. Like, that's true, but someone comes up to you and says, hey, I need a business website where I can have some sales reps that add some new pages every now and then. And then the rest of it, I just don't want to have to worry about. Well, WordPress sounds actually pretty perfect for that. And same thing with like Magento. I mean, Magento is super bloated and slow and inefficient. You got like 230 tables that need to be created just to, for a basic Magento install. Like that's massive. But if all your job is to sell products, then it does everything. You don't need to worry about tax codes. You don't need to be a developer to, to engineer, you know, engineer this problem. Then, then it becomes a problem like sometimes you get so infatuated or get stuck in an echo chamber where you start loving a framework too much. And this happens a lot where you, know, you, you get around the people who like the same thing that you do. It's normal. We're all human. But the problem is, um, it, especially, and I saw this a lot with junior developers, where you start them with a framework and then they never bother learning what's behind the scenes, what's going on you know, under it. So if you left them to their own demise, they would never be able to mature into a decent senior level developer because some, some of the things that I feel are, are core uh, knowledge that they would need to progress are actually so, super abstracted. Um, and also, it's, you know, the other thing is you, I, I hear a lot of times that I'm a Laravel developer or I'm a Symfony developer. 
It's like, well, unless you're actually developing plugins or modules where you profit off of the plugins for Symfony or, or Laravel, you're actually limiting your, your job market. It's also like saying, I'm a PHP developer. If you say that, you're, you're kind of stuck. I mean, for better or for worse, you can choose your own fate, but you know, if you're in the market to just be a developer, then the whole world's your oyster. It's just what you're willing to learn. And uh, you know, depending on the survival of the framework, like I've seen frameworks that have risen and fallen. I mean, you know, I, I think the job market is pretty scarce if you're a YUI developer. I don't know how many people are using Yahoo's user interface module or framework. But other than that, a lot of things go right with frameworks. It's like you get a very structured manner, the convention over configuration. Uh, and, and the other thing is it's preordained, which is awesome. If you have a startup or a large company, there's a lot of times where you could get lost in just meeting after meeting discussing the color of the bike shed, if you're familiar with that term, but just the fact it's so trivial and mundane, and yet someone is so passionate about where that line ending is, or where you open your brackets, or how you should query the database. And it's just, it's, it's, it's trivial in the, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, it's a limit reinventing the wheel. The problem has probably already been solved before. There's probably even certain things that they understand that you don't or that you haven't come across yet. And that's where I say on here that you, you stand on the shoulders of people who have already solved this problem. There's been numerous times where I'm like, I never thought of that. You know, I've never had to deal with that yet. I was like, I've never had to deal with a European market, so well, I didn't know that what the VAT codes were, that the numerous taxes per products, et cetera. So there's a lot of times where this can actually save you a bunch of time and money. Oop, and let me do. And the other thing is, it doesn't mean that your opinions are not valuable. By all means, you know, express them. Maybe they're valuable to the community. That's how new frameworks get created. But at the same sense, I've seen, I've worked at numerous companies where this exact situation happens to where developers bicker or decide, I want to do something different. And the next thing you know, you've got numerous standards. Uh, websites that have numerous date pickers just because they're like, I like this one better than this one. I want to do this on the front end. I want to do this on the back end. Uh, and then it's like, and that's why I like this quote on here. While it takes a bit of time to learn a framework's conventions, you save time in the long run by following convention. You get free functionality, you get, and you free yourself from the maintenance nightmare of tracking config files. Uh, convention also makes a very uniform system development, allowing other developers to jump in and help more easily. I can tell you that uh, being in charge of a team, one thing that really sucks is having to handhold someone during the ramp up time. I mean, you can think about, like, think about your current job. Like, if I was to hire a new developer, would it take them one day to ramp up, one week, one month? It's like, think about if, you, if all of your code was proprietary, that they've never seen before, it's all foreign. Uh, in a situation like that, uh, they, you know, they, they may think they're even ramped up and they'll make an erroneous mistake or, or an assumption. So the nice thing about frameworks is it gives a nice ubiquitous front for your developers to work as a team and have all your code kind of look more similar. Yeah? The documentation is already out there anyway. You don't have to write it. Yes, yes. Go to the framework documentation. Yes, the documentation should already be out there. Any decent or modern framework should definitely have documentation. So that's definitely a part uh, which saves you, again, time and money. And it's like, and the other thing which I like to emphasize is you don't know what you don't know. It's like a non-trivial you know, non application, especially if you're expecting growth, which everyone wants with their application, right? It's like the architectural is important as the quality of the code itself. Uh, you can have well-written pieces of code, but if we don't have good organization, uh, have a hard time when complexity increases. There's no need to wait till the project is halfway done to start thinking about the architecture. Uh, it's best to get started with, you know, or at the foundation level or in the frame. Uh, and this is where frameworks can also, again, be a love-hate relationship. They can either set you free or they can set you down to be tightly coupled and actually grounded or stuck to that framework for the rest of that application's life. It's like, that's what happens when things go wrong. It's like your application became trapped to the framework, especially if, it, if it's discontinued or if the next version is not, is not a direct linear upgrade. 
Uh, or the other thing is if you strip out a bunch of bloat, you realize that you're going to use this, this monolithic uh, framework, but you don't, you're just building an API. And so you decide, well, I'm going to figure out a way of stripping out all this unnecessary bloat, or I'm going to optimize it myself. Well, next thing you know, when the next version comes out, it's you cannot upgrade because there's so many breaking changes. They have to go around the way that you circumvented a bunch of their core code. Yes? Do you think this issue is relevant to Laravel, where it's like the top framework in the market right now? Because I don't really see it going away in the next mm -hmm. three, four, five years. Do I see it relevant to Laravel? Yes, in, in many different ways. Um, but that being said, um, We'll, we'll kind of uh, touch on that a little bit more later, but the main thing about it is uh, the, the creator of Laravel did a lot to add what I like to consider data contracts to where um, everything is, uh, tries to be as close as possible to um, a, a pure function as possible. So that way a request comes in, you can expect this response always. And then when you go to this module or this part of the application, you, can, you have to send this type of request and you will get this type of response. And that's really clean because you know what to expect and it helps you, de you know, decouple it and create smaller pieces. But at the same sense, there's a lot of times where it's still very opinionated. You need to use collections. You need to use their query builder. You know, once you include Eloquent, you're screwed. Like it's it's got a lot of things that that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And your question? Uh, a lot of people, when frameworks first started getting used in PHP, mm -hmm. would be like, "Oh, I don't need all that code." Yep. And they would believe that having a lot of code meant bloat. Yes. And I bet this hits on number, your point number three here. Yes. So what what do we need to do to uh, educate people that more code is not bloat? Yes. So yeah, most people when they when they think when they see a large framework, they'll think this code or uh, that it's bloated. But that's not that's not true, especially in a modern framework that uses dependency injection. Uh, it's one thing if it uses a bunch of conditional statements and loads in the classes preemptively um, to that way you know to bootstrap the entire application at once. And a lot of older frameworks kind of did this to you know to get go, but they they've matured. Laravel is one as well. Uh, where they've used a dependency injection feature. So the idea there is even though it has all these classes and configurations for using Redis for caching or using memcache or using MSQL or MySQL, um, because it injects the dependency into, uh, you know, into the IOC and, and so forth, it actually doesn't need any of the other classes. The, the, the application actually forgets all these other pieces of code that may be included. So, just because a framework is large doesn't mean it's inefficient or bloated. Um, but there's still times, you know, more, you know, to extrapolate on why I included that in there, there's a lot of times where people still think, like, I can do this better. So in other words, they would just want to deviate from the framework just a little bit. Um, inevitably, though, if, you know, it sometimes bites them at the end to where it actually limits their upgrade path or they're stuck in a legacy application. They don't get security updates. Uh, and that's also where I, I talk about tightly coupled code. And I actually mention in here Laravel's fa facades. And they're, in, they're included as a quick and dirty way of dealing with you know, injected behaviors and or dealing with the IOC. And so in here, they're dangerous because they allow you to sprinkle in framework specific dependencies in code without much thought and without being especially obvious, like I said, to, compared to where. I'm calling this class, I need to inject these dependencies. It, it, it's mandatory that I use this in this class. Uh, like Facade should be limited to code that is tightly coupled to the framework. Uh, and this also allows you to where, uh, when, when you have code bases that, that heavily relies on a framework, that you, you make sure that still the code that utilizes the framework is still isolated. And that way, if you wanted to, you can actually say like, well, here's my, Here's my application's independent code. It doesn't matter what framework I'm using. It just matters that I get this response back. I need this object, or I need an instance of this, or I need this array. And by doing that, then you can actually free yourself from using any framework or switching to another framework. And that's a whole other topic, <laughs> which uh, is also one of the like when I originally did this, I ended up th this this presentation took way too long. Yes. Doesn't that also um, kind of take away the advantages of using a framework because you're you're so concerned about not using the framework's tools mm -hmm. 
because you don't want to be coupled to the framework, but then you end up not using the framework's tools. Right. You use the framework in the first place. Yes, there are, there's a very good point. Sometimes it depends, uh, if you want to, if you're exclusively using a framework, then yes, it, you know, and, and you don't see yourself changing, then there's, there is no true harm uh, to actually just being tightly coupled to the framework. It's, and when I say the framework, let's use like WordPress as an example. I mean, there's, it's highly unlikely that you'll be switching from WordPress to a different CMS. Uh, and if you did, you'd probably, you know, there's maybe very few code that you'd want to take with you. Uh, but the, the more key concept there is just remember is like, the more that you put static method calls or the more that you put more of the framework calls into what could be independent classes or factory methods, uh, the more that that cannot be used by another service um, or by another application. Oh, and it also limits you from being able to refactor out uh, certain aspects of the framework. Uh, but again, like I said, uh, this is a, a love-hate relationship. It's not like there's, the, the, the inconvenient truth is the fact that there is no silver bullet uh, to this answer. This is the one that always frustrated me, and every framework has it. It's a blessing and a curse, it's just the auto magic hell. That's where um, in order to give the developers or the framework as much control as possible, there's hooks, as they call like the life cycle of this request. And so in here, this is the, the controller life cycle. And this one, you've got the before filter, the before render, the after filter, after render. In the model, you've got the before save, before validate, after validate. You've got hooks galore. And uh, properly utilized, this gives the developer a lot of freedom and control uh, over the application. It makes it a beautiful thing. Um, it, in its worst case scenario, this makes it to where magic stuff happens that doesn't get communicated to new developers or even other teams. And so then you're like, why is this behavior occurring? I just said, create this new user and save. It's like, oh, well, you know, th three classes down the line inside of, uh, that's extended inside of here, you've got some magic functionality, functionality attached to this filter or to this hook. And uh, in situations like that, it's, you know, without being properly abstracted or documented, it ends up adding extra layers of, of frustration, uh, especially if, if, if the developer feels uh, disempowered or that this is no longer in their level of control. I mean, I'm sure that we've all had situations where we're like, oh, I need to add this new feature, but a developer a year ago put all this stuff down in this base class, and now I, I don't know how to work around it. Um, and the other thing which I like to put in is uh, most frameworks uh, are single domain design. Um, and this may be, uh, it doesn't get talked about a lot, especially in the PHP world, but there's a domain-driven development where uh, you try to limit your application and your scope to what it, the, you know, where it's the master of its domain. Um, and honestly, without going on too much of a tangent, I think that uh, this is like the ideal concept of where you hear the microservice buzzword is uh, there's no such thing in my personal opinion as a microservice and a regular service. It's just the domain that it's in control of. Um, and if you have too many hands that venture off into different domains, like I can manipulate this even though you're in charge of it, or I can do this even though I'm not supposed to, then that's where things get mucked up and everything becomes monolithic and tightly coupled to one another. But by default, frameworks presume that I, you're launching this framework for this domain and that everything is related. So that's why you have um, the dispatcher, the router. Um, you've got the, uh, the controller and you've got the models and the views. And it doesn't say, well, these are only required for our payment gateway or these are only required for our front end uh, or for our sales team or this is required for here. It just presumes that it's all within the same domain. And by default, it's hard to find documentation on how to properly split that out. So that's what another gripe we hear a lot of people say is like, I'd like to create microservices. Well, you can. Uh, you just have to make sure that you, you separate your concerns into like domain-driven design or domain-driven development. And there's actually good books on that as well. Um, Miscellaneous thoughts, since we've kind of gone through the pros and the cons and kind of like the abstract thing. I didn't want to focus on a specific framework too much because everyone has their favorite. As, as, you know, as you mentioned, Laravel is pretty much the dominant one in the PHP community. It still shares a ton of components with Symfony. Uh, and there, there are still loyal fan bases for you know, even Code Igniter. 
Uh, there's, uh, you know, people still use Cake PHP. Um, I've run into some zealots for, uh, you know, still to this day for Falcon. You know, so it's one of those things to where, when, when you're dealing with this, it's too, it's very easy to get caught in an echo chamber. It's too easy to go to a conference like this where everyone thinks the same and, and all programs in PHP, and it's easy to all have the same mentality. Uh, and then it just becomes an echo chamber or a bunch of ditto heads. Um, the other thing to watch out for is what I call Reddit-driven development. You go on to this, if, you're, if you don't look or challenge your, your level of thought, it's easy to fall victim to thinking, this is the best because everyone else thinks this way. Well, does everyone actually think this way? Uh, you know, can, you know, the conference-driven development. If, if, you, if all you do is go to you know, Laracon, of course they're gonna say that Laravel's the best answer, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's just inevitable. And I'm not saying don't go, there you'll get some valuable information. But uh, at the same sense, it's, it's easy to where, you know, this tribalism where it says, I chose the better framework than you, and you're stupid for choosing this. It's, it's easy to fall into this, this, this problem. We're all developers, we should all be, you know, it's a zero-sum game on knowledge. We should be trying to help each other out as much as possible. It's like loudest guy-driven decisions, and that's, it's, you know, I'm sure we all worked in an environment where the guy I'm talking about, where if, if he was given just an inch of freedom, or he says like, where I, and instead of gouging out his eyes with his toes, he probably would have implemented parts of our application in Falcon. And he wouldn't have asked for permission, he would have just done it. Um, and not necessarily a bad thing. If you're given that level of autonomy, there's nothing wrong with that, but at the same sense, you can actually create dissension and, and conflict within your own team or your level of developers. And the other one's composer-driven development. And this one I fall victim to a lot. And it's a, it's a love-hate relationship, again, with someone already solved the problem, there's a composer package, just pull it in. But if you don't do your research, or you can actually end up pulling in 30 dependencies, and then they have their own dependencies of something else. And the next thing you know, you're, you're adding extra layers of complexity because you just didn't want to do any real research on it yourself. So that's the other point what I want to say is like frameworks are tools, they're not religions. It's like just because you chose to use Laravel, just because you chose to use WordPress or Concrete 5, doesn't mean that you, know, you have to be thought less of or thought more of, you're not holier than thou. Yes? So out of curiosity, say you had a client come to you, you want to do some moonlighting, uh -huh. they need a new app, it's a crud app, and if you could have your pick mm -hmm. and start doing your app, Uh -huh. What framework would you choose for a simple CRUD app? What framework would you choose for a simple CRUD app? Um, I have, my go-to is that, you know, in that situation is usually Lumen, uh, mainly because it, uh, like you said, Laravel is a very common one. Most of the stuff I do is API only, uh, so that I don't need to worry about, you know, Blade or anything like that. That being said, um, it's becoming more and more popular uh, to just use Symfony. Uh, especially with Symfony 4. I mean, a lot of the core components that you're using in Laravel is actually just using Symfony. Um, and they're, um, in fact, the, the uh, uh, enhancements that they have included with Symfony 4 uh, actually made two frameworks irrelevant. Slim and Silix used to exist because they wanted just lightweight APIs. And the, the developers listened and decided when we launch Symfony 4, we're gonna make it to where it's as decoupled and as modular as possible. In order to do that, like I said, you have to have clean input and output for your individual packages and your methods and et cetera, et cetera. By doing that, then you can actually unmoor each individual part and say like, I know that when I send it to here, I need, I need to send it as an instance of this request and I can expect an instance of this back, like a promise. And by doing that, it actually liberates you a lot more. But that being said, I've also done stuff uh, within the past two years and, uh, you know, in, in multiple ones. I don't want to get lost in the details of there, but uh, the, the important thing there is, uh, is like I said here, test and research before you decide. You know, and, hi and hire the right people. Hang out with, with open-minded people is the best way to put it. If, if you go to people who want to uh, reaffirm you for the decisions that you made, then, you know, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna feel like you've always made the right choice. 
And uh, it's also nice to look at other languages, other paradigms, other, um, you know, other design principles, like the factory method, the you know, repository method, method the uh, you know, domain-driven design, looking at things that may not be included in just um, in your standard paradigm. Speaking of which, uh, one that we, was the common ground was all of these, you know, all the major frameworks now use MVC. <laughs> and I remember writing code before MVC. It was not great, the best way to put it. Um, in fact, a lot of it was actually decoupled little, as you'd say, microservices to where you'd go to a new folder and you'd have Apache or your web server just say, presume index.php. And by there, that would be your bootstrapper, your index.php would bootstrap saying, I need this, here's my data functions, here's my display functions, and then render it. And then whatever parameters come in, do it there. So then every little folder was its own little microservice or its own little bootstrap to actually load the dependencies necessary. Um, and it could work, but you need to be really disciplined. You'd have a shared library folder and stuff like that, but it, um, MVC, uh, it was actually uh, developed back in, was it 1970? Yeah, uh, back uh, for Smalltalk. And the idea behind that was to do that, to uh, abstract out the, the business logic and uh, you know, the way that you're gonna render or display it uh, into separate levels of concern. Uh, however, this, the, the web, early web, wasn't using this at all. It was a paradigm that was lost and forgotten or was in a niche market. And we actually have Ruby on Rails to thank for bringing this to the forefront. It was a paradigm shift. And uh, it, you know, if, if everyone was, again, like on the other side, was just hype-driven development, back in 2006, 2008 or so, everyone would have started switching to Ruby because Ruby on Rails introduced these awesome design patterns that was very liberating and helped uh, help us write better code. Uh, not the, the fortunate thing is other languages took note and adopted them. But that being said, if you're stuck in your, in your echo chamber or in the PHP world or your Python world and you're not caring or you think less of the people in the Ruby world, then you would have missed this paradigm shift. Uh, you, you know, so it's, it's important, to, like I said, to, to test and, and keep an open mind. There are certain things that you can love about it. There are certain things you can hate about it. And that's, and that's good. Uh, being a, you know, a, an e, uh, evangelicalist or an apologist for a particular framework and defending its flaws sometimes doesn't really help the community as whole. Uh, and if that was the case, maybe we wouldn't have had some of the advancements that we had in current frameworks. Uh, let's see. It's like, don't be unwilling to change. And this one is not directly related to frameworks, but again, they're all tools, even, even our core language. If you remember, PHP started off as an API layer for C. And in a way, COBOL, back in the day, you know, was actually very slowly adopted. It took, I believe, six to eight years to actually gain a good foothold. Um, and the whole premise of, of it was just that, like, instead of having a specific programming language for your mainframe or for your computers that you bought, because these were back when you, know, you, you buy one computer for a company, instead of having a specific language, it's like, why not write in COBOL? It will go to any mainframe, it will go to anything like that. And most developers scoffed at that. It's like, computer costs, you know, my salary. We're never going to use anything but this computer. <laughs> you know, we're always going to use this. There's no reason to have modular code or reusable code because it's never going to go to the system. And I'm not going to give up my performance benefits to write it in COBOL if I don't see an immediate gain for it. So if everyone kept that train of thought, then having as many ubiquitous languages as we do or having uh, the evolution of programming as we know it, we could still have like specific computers have specific languages. And so you can kind of see the evolution of programming. It's the same thing with, with frameworks as with, the, with new languages. Like I never see myself using anything but Laravel. I never see myself using anything but Node.js. It'll solve all my problems. And, uh, and by, you know, by doing that, sometimes you, you, you fail to ask why was this developed? Why are they using this? How is it being used? Who's behind it? So what problems are they trying to solve? And so like I said, if it wasn't, uh, as, program, we <laughs> as, as programming and development evolves, new languages and paradigms will emerge. Uh, with it will be new tools and frameworks. Some will look back on a laugh that they were ever popular to begin with. Others will change coding forever. Um, and so that's the important thing. So in conclusion to this, 
it's, the message I always like to try to emphasize is we're all developers, and hopefully we all love what we do. I know that I do, and I'm, I'm excited to be a developer. I'm excited to go to meetups. I'm excited to look at different languages, different paradigms, uh, different frameworks. I definitely find some that I don't like, some that make my eyes gloss over, but it's important to look at why they were developed, who's using them, what problems are they solving, and by doing that, it can help us all get along better, <laughs> not be so tribal, as well as maybe learn something. As, instead of thinking, like, I wish I was using my favorite framework because it has this. Then the next time, you can actually go to your favorite framework and say, you know what? Why was this never implemented in Laravel? Why was this not included in Cake? Why was et cetera, et cetera? And uh, also, one other thing which I, I will mention is uh, that as frameworks evolve, languages evolve as well. Like uh, talking about Node as well, Node was pretty much uh, the paradigm, just like Ruby on Rails with the paradigm shift for MVC, uh, Node is the paradigm shift for concurrency and event loops in many different languages. It's been adopted by you know, C Sharp. There's four different packages I can think of in PHP that do the event loops as well. You can even call lib event directly and create your own event loop in raw PHP if you wanted to. And, uh, and there, things are constantly evolving for the better. Um, and the cool thing about it is uh, languages take note. So in the same gripes in the video that I did not show, where Rasmus was talking about how frameworks suck but still use them, one of the things he did point out is like, maybe you don't need a, a generalized framework because of these problems. And shortly after, because it was done in, two, in uh, 2013, that was still when PHP you know, 5.6 was being uh, released. And now with PHP 7, they're like, oh, well, now we have access to OP cache. And so a lot of these things that I was griping about having to do every iteration are now cached by default. Um, and now with uh, the, rat actually in PHP 7.4 that just got ratified, uh, that there is now a preload function in OP cache. So new frameworks that come out in the future will actually have the opportunity to bootstrap and preload the framework into memory and create its own little heap stack. So one of the other gripes that people have had about PHP in, different, you know, in the past about always constructing and deconstructing on every single request, now there's even an option that they can implement where you can actually create a heap stack for your application. And uh, so like I said, things are evolving, things are looking great. Don't, uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't scoff, you know, and just remember to keep an open mind. And I guess that's my primary message.